So Michael has uh, is probably our most significant state lawmaker in terms of drug policy and criminal justice issues, and that's a that's a tough um, um, uh, bar to, uh, to to carry, but uh, he's done it. Uh, he has uh, sponsored legislation that will allow for medical psychedelic access and uh, other imperatives in drug policy reform. And uh, yeah, why don't, why don't you uh, kind of uh, start talking about the legislation you have? And I'll sit down here too. And, uh, uh, which bill would you like me to start with? Let's start about the right to try. Okay. okay. So, uh, so I filed a bill uh, last session that would allow patients with debilitating. So, uh, our right to try bill. So, uh, yes, yeah, so last session uh, we worked together on a bill that would allow patients with debilitating, uh, life, life altering uh, medical problems to, to be able to, to try new uh, new medicine in order to, uh, to alleviate their symptoms. And, uh, one of them was psilocybin. There was a, there was a large list that, that even I'm sure is much more familiar with than I am to, to allow them to, uh, to try these at the state level. At the national level, we had President Trump and, and uh, the congressional Republicans uh, supporting a bill that would uh, allow this at the federal level. So uh, our bill would, would bring this down to the state level to allow them to, to have access to, to these uh, psychedelics that would uh, assist them with their, their pain. Yeah, you know, the, um, the uh, federal right to try statute, and we'll talk about this, but it's no agricultural, uh, is uh, as a Zoom talk with us. But uh, um, right to try at the federal level uh, provides for investigational drug access to all drugs. In Missouri, we have a Schedule One exclusion, so Schedule One drugs are excluded from right to try access in Missouri. So Michael's bill removed that exclusion from the list of psychedelics that are prohibited in Missouri statute, and uh, it also decriminalizes uh, personal possession. Yeah. So uh, do we need to talk about the other bill? Yeah, let's talk about the uh, So uh, I, I filed an additional bill. Yeah, maybe uh, here, here, here. Should I stop by Yeah. How, how are we with the recording here? I mean, I can't really tell. Okay. I'll just hold this in my hand and make sure it'll pick up anything that goes off the line. I generally have a pretty loud speaking voice, so I think, I think we'll be okay if I just talk loudly. So uh, I, I filed a bill that would allow um, individuals who are charged with drug possession. Uh, currently, that, that's a felony offense. So um, above a certain amount, um, certain grams. Uh, in, in Missouri statute, unless it's like marijuana, you have your medical card, or, uh, or uh, if it's more than 10 grams of marijuana, uh, or excuse me, more than 35 grams of marijuana, any drug possession offenses can be automatically charged as a felony. So, so, so the, the bill uh, I filed that we worked to, together on, it would uh, re remove the offense of a felony for over 35, and instead it would it would make it a misdemeanor. So it's it's a step towards legalization uh, for, for, for marijuana and, and, and psychedelics, where, um, where where instead of ha having a felony on your record. That, that prevents you from getting a gainful employment, that uh, incarcerates you, that, that uh, negatively affects you for the rest of your life. Instead, it would be a misdemeanor, uh, which, which would be a step towards the ultimate goal of legalization. Yeah, so uh, Oregon has completely decriminalized all drugs. So all personal possession of drugs in Oregon is now uh, not an arrestable or a chargeable offense. So that's personal possession quantities as opposed to trafficking quantities, so I want to make it clear. Uh, but five other American states have done what Michael has proposed. So, um, you know, the five other American states, instead of uh, automatic felony charges for a drug possession offense, they make it misdemeanors. <coughs> Oklahoma is one of those states. So, uh, we got an estimate, I think, from the Urban Institute, which is founded by the John and Laura Arnold Foundation, that said in five years, if we defelonize personal possession offenses for drug possession, 
We would stay, save the state like $225 million, starting $50 million, somewhere in that range. So from a uh, budgetary standpoint, because that's something that's also as a state representative you're kind of involved with, like understanding where we spend the state's money, where we take, spend, spend the taxpayers' money, right? That's a, that's a good chunk of change, right? That, that can be either return to the taxpayers or need for another productive purpose. Absolutely. So I, I consider myself a, a budget hawk. Uh, I, I was the only representative to vote against the uh, the, the entire state budget because it, it increased our, our spending uh, 20% over the last two years. So uh, I voted against the, the state budget, uh, and, and I'm big on not wasting our, our taxpayer dollars. And incarcerating people who are nonviolent uh, offenders for a victimless crime is, is a waste of taxpayer dollars. So uh, this would change the offense to, to a misdemeanor, uh, wouldn't ruin their lives, and uh, it, was, it was proud of work on that. Let me ask you this question from an ideological or even a philosophical standpoint. You know, why do you believe that we should be looking more obedient to people who are uh, charged with non-violent, victimless uh, drug possession crimes? My, my view on crime is that for, for, for crimes that have been committed, there needs to be a victim. If, if uh, otherwise, I think people should, should generally be able to do as they please as long as they're not harming others. So uh, that, that's a very, I guess we would call it a very libertarian viewpoint. Do you think that's, that kind of viewpoint is like becoming more prevalent? I, I think it slowly is. Uh, it's not the point where, where, I, where I'd like it to be. I think down the road it, it may be. Uh, among people my age, the, the under 30s, uh, and, and some some over that as well, but uh, generally the younger crowd is, is more uh, open to the idea of, uh, of drug reform, criminal justice reform, uh, issues that have been passionate about in the legislature. You know, I think we've seen sentencing reform advance over the last few years significantly. Like Cody Smith is the budget chairman from Joplin, passed a bill a couple of years ago. I think this right before the election. But he passed a bill to uh, remove some mandatory minimums from, the, from some nonviolent charges. You know, and then Sheree Tolson Reich, who's going to be talking to here later, has also been active on sentencing reform, particularly for nonviolent drug offenders. So it seems that this is like getting some steam. You know, we might not take those, those kind of individuals who that agree with us all the way in terms of they're not ready for decriminalization or legalization, but it seems like there's a sentiment where people are realizing we can't keep incarcerating at the levels we have. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, even if they're not with us 100%, there's a lot of representatives and senators who, who see that there's problems with, with, the, with our current system that uh, might need to be changed. Uh, I worked with, with um, Representative uh, Richard West in the uh, Crime Prevention Committee. He's a former uh, law enforcement guy. And, uh, and there is a bill that would uh, add substances to a, to a felony list for for an ailment. And, uh, and, I, and I remember these concerns about having the fel felony charges that that uh, ruin people's lives, can't get gainful employment. And, and he was the one who submitted an amendment to um, to make it a uh, make it a misdemeanor offense. And so he's a member of law enforcement. Yeah. So it's it's not just uh, you know young people in college students. There's people who work in law enforcement who. Had, had, had to make the arrest who realized that there's, uh, there's problems with the current system. Do you think people who go into law enforcement want to be arresting people for felony possession or felony charges for like public paint or whatever other ailments that are on that bill? I, I'd say overall probably not because uh, in order to to arrest some of these people, they have to put their own lives in danger to arrest uh, to arrest uh, nonviolent offenders. If you have to, uh, to, to break into someone's house, arrest them for a drug offense, they're putting themselves at risk. Is that something that you're hearing more from law enforcement these days? Uh, it's, it's a sentiment I've heard. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your district. Uh, where's your district? So my district is uh, District 56. It uh, starts at, at the southern edge of Kansas City proper, and it stretches about 45 minutes south through Cass County, uh, through the cities of Belton, and it stretches uh, down towards Bates County. So it's a very uh, large and diverse district. I have urban Kansas City, I have suburban Belton, and I have uh, rural areas in the south. So lots of different, uh, lots of different uh, professions, lots of different ways of life. I have farmers, I have uh, 
suburbanites, all types of different constituents. What kind of uh, feedback for these uh, people that haven't gotten to your constituents on some of these proposals? I mean, you definitely make the views on a couple of them. Yeah, so, uh, you know, have, have you gotten any feedback from your the people who elected you? So, uh, most of my feedback from people who are familiar with my bills uh, have been positive. I haven't had anyone uh, who came out strongly from my constituency uh, against the idea of, of not, you know, incarcerating people for, for multiple years for, for nonviolent offenses. Uh, over, overwhelmingly, it's been a, a positive reception uh, from, from the segment who have provided feedback. Uh, granted, a, a lot of uh, the, the normal people, the, the normal constituents, if they're, they're not paying attention to, to every single bill that their legislators filing, but for those who are, it's, it's been largely positive. Yeah, I mean, like, ordinary people are just way too busy, like, putting food on the table and making a living, right? Exactly. You know, so, you know, as someone whose job it is to pay attention to all the crazy things in politics, right, you know, um, you know, it seems like you haven't had any given anyone any reason to say you should get this guy out of office, at least not yet. <laughs> uh, it depends who you ask, but uh, not for my constituency. Usually the, 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 the harshest criticism is from the hallways in the, in, in the Capitol, where, which didn't elect me in there in the first place. Um, whenever I, I receive pushback uh, from, from, from leadership, from, uh, from other representatives, I have, to, I have to, to reiterate the fact that uh, leadership in legislature, that they're not my boss. Uh, the people who elected me, they're the person uh, that, that I have to answer to when I, when I run for re-election. Uh, so they, they're the ones who can fire me. It's, it's not House leadership who, who the, the legislature elected. It's, it's, it's my constituents. Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, like, so can you kind of describe how power is structured in the Missouri House of Representatives? Uh, so, so the Missouri House is very uh, top-down in the way that power is, is organized. And uh, I'd like to see that change at some point, but the uh, the speaker has the most power in the house. He has uh, a, a very large sway over what ultimately gets passed or, or what does not get passed. So every single bill uh, has to be referred by the speaker to a committee. If the speaker hates a bill, he just won't refer it to a committee, and it becomes all, almost impossible for that bill to pass. Um, and he also picks the committee chair. Exactly. So, and then uh, if a bill does get referred to a committee, that then uh, the committee chairman can choose whether to hear it or not. So if uh, even if the speaker does refer it, if the chairman that the speaker selected doesn't like the bill, it, it's not it's not going to pass. Then the, the majority leader has to put it on the floor calendar. So if the majority leader of the house doesn't like the bill, it's not going to pass. So so there there's numerous steps along the way where if, if someone hates your bill, it's, it's not going to pass. Well, you know, there's uh, someone hates your bill or someone hates you. Yeah. Right. So. so uh, <clears throat> Uh, so in a lot of sense, you know, in my experience, you know, navigating these processes is, is a lot about relationship building. I, I, I'd agree with that. So uh, in the legislature, I, I generally try to try to uh, have a good working relationship with, with, with all of the representatives. So uh, even people that I disagree with probably 90% of the time. Uh, if I disagree with you 90% of the time, that still makes it was 10% of the issues where, where we can work on. And, and make uh, changes to improve the lives of Missourians. So um, I've worked a lot with uh, members of, of the, the Black Caucus, which, uh, except for one representative, is, is completely Democrat. And, um, and, and we've been able to, to work on uh, drug reform issues, criminal justice issues, and, um, and, and a few others. And I, when I first ran for office, I don't know if I really envisioned that, but I've worked uh, a lot with with Black Caucus Democrats and, and others on, on a lot of bills. Uh, where are we in time? It's 1248. Okay. So let's kind of dig into this because this is a subject that's very interesting. So uh, you had a bill, you filed a bill to allow uh, nonviolent felons who completed their sentence to apply for a restoration of their sentence to them. I think this has two big constituencies. One is Missourians who are Missourians, 
who are big Second Amendment advocates, and two, there are members of the black community who are often disproportionately targeted for uh, firearm for, for, for felony charges in the first place. So, like, you know, I'll give you an example, like, you know, a 6, 17, 18 year old kid in Kansas City gets popped with a couple pounds of, of marijuana, gets a felony conviction, you know, deals with it, serves a sentence, whatever. You know, and then 10, 15 years later, you know, he's um, in a, a, you know, he's got a family, he's putting food on the table. You know, maybe he's living in a rough neighborhood and he's got to protect himself and his family. So he has a, uh, a he's illegally possessing firearm. And then one day something happens that is out of his control and he gets arrested for illegal possession, right? And, you know, maybe the original offense that uh, got him a felony is not a big deal, but, you know, now, you know, he's got a family and he's facing charges of potential prison time, and, and that's a big impact on that community. And I think about, particularly in Colombia, where one third of young black men have felony charges, right? This has a big impact. So uh, I think you actually got a couple of co sponsors on that bill from the, from the black Democrats in the, in the House. That, that's correct. So uh, with this bill, it, it, it does cross ideological lines in, in a way where we're going to have uh, criminal justice and then gun rights. And I think uh, gun rights are, are a fundamental right that we have to defend ourselves. So by depriving people of, of their right to self-defense because of a, of a victimless crime they committed several years ago, I, I think that's a violation of, of, of our Second Amendment rights. So even members of uh, Democrats who are generally not usually the biggest supporters of of uh, less stringent gun rights, uh, their support for, for criminal justice reform realized that there's that hypocrisy when uh, we were depriving certain groups of their gun rights when, when others still have theirs. And, and, that, and it does disproportionately affect minorities, uh, even though the use of certain substances is almost identical among marijuana and, and, and other uh, Lower uh, drug crimes, uh, blacks are disproportionately, uh, African Americans are disproportionately uh, charged at a much higher rate. So, uh, uh, who, who is it? Was it was Kevin Windham, Representative Windham, who was responsible? I, I have to double check, but I, I believe so. Yeah, so did you guys have any talks about this? We, we had some brief discussions. Um, yeah, what did he say? And he's like a St. Louis Democrat, right? I'll, yeah, I would have to double check who was Kevin, but. Um, I had a long discussion with, with members of, uh, of the Black Caucus. I did have a discussion with Kevin. I, I'm, I'd have to double check if it's that, that, that bill that we discussed. I know he did co sponsor one of my bills, but uh, discussing that bill, um, I have to double check if it was Kevin. But one of the members of, of the, the Democratic Black Caucus, uh, they, they, they said that um, it's, it's not conscionable to to deprive people of their Second Amendment rights uh, once they've uh, completed the terms of their sentence for, for nonviolent uh, offense. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, I'm curious about this dynamic, you know, both because, you know, uh, you know, Joseph Wright up in St. Louis and also now living in Kansas City and also having lived in Columbia, you know, I've been aware of the impact of, you know, uh, you know, someone who's a ballot is now in passive protection, it's almost passive protective their family, right, you know, and they may not be doing anything else that's criminal, but because they have that prior record that triggers a second charge of their cut with a weapon, and that very much uh, is a barrier and an impediment to, uh, a, you know, a, a significant portion of the black population that's say in terms of your liberty and their economic freedom, right, but on a kind of a broader basis, to kind of get a little bit more abstract, I see a lot of issues in criminal justice kind of where you know conservative or libertarian Republicans um, are realizing they have something in common with you know very liberal Democrats who represent minorities for the reason that those are those minority populations are usually the most affected, right? And you know uh, on a long term basis, right? Because you know this was your first year, you introduced a whole bunch of bills that are maybe a little radical for right now, uh, but over time as consensus builds, you know I see this kind of alignment between more libertarian Republicans and, and uh, Democrats who represent minority districts. I see that as being a very powerful thing to advance 
uh, issues of uh, drug decriminalization in general. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, most of the bills that would get passed in the legislature are, are minute, little changes. So the, these bills, in comparison, are, are much more sweeping changes. Uh, so, so it won't pass in one year. It might, it, I doubt it will pass in two. My hope is, uh, is we make very full progress. So the first year, uh, it didn't go very far. The second year, I'm hoping for uh, more committee hearings on these bills. And maybe on the third year, we, we get a floor vote. So with the floor vote, we can actually see where the House stands uh, of the 163 members. How many of them support it? How many oppose it? Uh, that gives us a good uh, blueprint of where to go forward, where we know where we stand, which, uh, which is hard to do when, uh, when you first file a bill and, and you don't know exactly where the numbers lie. Yeah, you know, that, that kind of, I think, points to another reason why we wanted to work with you, is that, you know, you have, you were elected in November of 2020, right? This was your first year of service to the people of Missouri, right? So, you have seven more years to build relationships, to make uh, deals, right, to, to figure out, to help other people who are like-minded and potential allies get elected, right? So, you know, you know, Oregon was the first state to actually completely decriminalize drug possession, right? It's a problem to take, you know, five to, five to seven years to accomplish that in Zero, right? Um, you know, because we'll have, because, you know, from a national level, we'll see the impact in the uh, things that have happened in Oregon that will trickle down through policy papers and think tanks and, and activist groups to other states, right? Uh, you know, things will develop here in Missouri in terms of our budget crisis and our criminal justice uh, uh, issues, right? And maybe in three or five years, we're at a place where these things, you know, that we're using created the, the foundational idea that we're ready to hand uh, a broad based consensus. Yeah, I'll throw in the caveat. Uh... I'll have seven more years, assuming my, my constituency continues to re-elect me, so uh, as long as I don't upset them, I, sh I should be uh, all right, but... Um, you, 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 uh, is, is anyone going to run against you this uh, next election? I'm not aware of any uh, yet. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a Democrat. I'm not, I'm not aware of anyone running the primary against me. It's a very uh, Republican district, so if you win the primary, you're, you're, you're golden in my, uh, in my area, so uh, I've not heard of anyone wanting to run against me. In, uh, in the election, but uh, as even was alluding to, uh, th th these bills are going to take multiple years. So if we're able to get it done, um, assuming I'm, I'm, I'm continuously reelected, uh, I I'd be very happy if we get it done uh, when, when I'm turning out. Uh, so okay, uh, last question, and then I'll we'll, uh, open up for a few questions and uh, move to the next session. But uh, talk about the role of lobbyists in, in Jefferson City, and particularly. Lobbyists who you've seen be effective on other issues. Yeah, so uh, lo lobbyists play a, a very large role in the legislative process in Missouri, uh, to even a much larger extent than I had anticipated going in. So the much much of the bills that are passed in the legislature were uh, written by lobbyists. So the, the general way that legislation gets passed is that uh, a lobbyist. Uh, has, has clients who want to see a specific issue passed. The lobbyist helps craft the bill, then they, they pass it to a legislator who then um, who then drafts the bill and files the bill. Uh, assuming it gets referred to a committee, the uh, the lobbyist then speaks in favor of the bill and, uh, and then pushes the bill further down the process. So lobbyists who, who likely gave money to the speaker majority leader, they, they then request that, that they uh, they push the bill along. And, uh, and that's nothing against the current speaker uh, majority leader. It's, it's the way it's always been done. But, uh, but, but then the bill gets pushed along, and then um, at, at the end of the session, then most likely the lobbyist contributes to the person who filed their bill. So it's, it's, a, it's a very circular system. Yeah, you know, and I think there's both good and bad aspects of the system. But you know, one, one thing I really kind of want to dial in here is that there's so many like new parts of this process, right? You have to get the speaker to refer your bill. You have to get the chairman of the committee that the bill gets sent to to actually hold a hearing, right? Then you got to talk to all the members of the committee, at least the ones that you think that will be favorable to your legislation. 
right? And, and while I think the electoral side of this in terms of financially supporting campaigns is important, you know, there's also, I think, you know, the ideological alignment, right? You're not going to try to work with someone who disagrees with you on a very significant ideological basis, right? But, you know, um, just being able to have those conversations, sometimes off the record, uh, you know, to advance something that, you know, especially in criminal justice, right, you know, because, like, people who are incarcerated don't typically have a lot of voices for them, right? Uh, more so maybe now than, you know, five years ago, but, um, you know, the, the process is something that takes a lot of careful attention to. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. Uh, if someone is completely opposed to you on, on the specific issue you're, you're looking at, uh, if someone is, is completely opposed to the drug reform, uh, I'm not going to talk about this specific issue with them. Uh, although, if, if they're diametrically opposed to me on other issues, uh, like, uh, like like the, the, the Democrats uh, and, and most members of the Black Caucus, we're going to disagree overwhelmingly on the majority of issues. But on this issue, uh, we, we overwhelmingly agree. So so even though we're we're diametrically opposed on, on taxes and spending and guns and, and uh, in life and, and other issues on, on, on drug reform, uh, we, we both see the problems with the current system that we have. So uh, I've worked with them over, over members of my own party who are uh, drug warriors who, who believe in mass incarceration. So let's open up for a few questions. And uh, again, where are we on time? It's uh, one o'clock. Okay, we'll, we'll go for a few minutes on that. So, so, so the, the marijuana debate, in my mind, is largely over. Um, it's a question of how, not, not if, right? And so there's like two different ballot initiatives, and then Representative Shevet Dogan has, has uh, uh, got a, a pretty good marijuana legalization bill that has no restrictions on cultivation. So, you know, we're, with Michael, he said, look, that the marijuana issue is going to be handled, there's going to be a lot of controversy, there's going to be a lot of this, that, and the other, in terms of who wants to do what, and we'll see what happens. Right, so Michael, he's stuck specifically to uh, psychedelics and uh, de decolonizing uh, with the intent to ultimately decriminalize drug possession. Now, if you're talking about uh, bring, being able to grow and possess botanical, uh, you know, psychedelic medicines like mushrooms, um, I would say, you know, uh, we we are looking to pathways to decriminalize those things, right? Um, does that does that kind of answer the question? So you answer no. The, the bill that I filed does not deal specifically with cultivation. There's been other bills filed to deal with that, as Ethan said, but my bill uh, dealt with personal possession of, of, of the substances rather than cultivation. Yeah. Is there a map? Map for, for drug possession? So yeah, that's all defined by statute. So in the Missouri Criminal Code, you look at the Controlled Substances Act, there's trafficking quantities and there's personal possession quantities. And, and some of these drugs are personal possession quantities are quite high. Um, so yeah, there are amounts, but you know, you would, would have to look at it, the actual text of the statute to uh, uh, for specifics. And how are you finding the reception among maybe skeptical uh, people, skeptical colleagues in terms of your ability to kind of shift the narrative and craft a narrative of, okay, um, I, I think there's certainly a national uh, opening 
as you mentioned, people of our age generally uh, are certainly more open to, especially victimless, uh, crime issues. Is, is, is there reception in the house on such issues? I'd say that, that I'd say the overwhelming majority of, of the representatives are, are open to at least hearing different ideas. Um, I, I was speaking with, with, with one of my colleagues about uh, my bill to, to defelonize uh, drug possession, and, and he said, uh, well, you, you know, I, I agree that we shouldn't be putting people in, in prison and, and that, that'll ruin their lives, but, you know, I'm also, I also have concerns about but people having addiction and what they, they'll do while all addicted. And he said, and so we, we went back and forth and, and I said, you know, this bill ends up coming to the floor. Um, what do you vote for? And he said, no, not in the current form. And I said, well, what, what if you put on an amendment that says, uh, instead, instead of putting them in, in, in prison, what about a, a drug class? And he said, I'd vote for that. So, um, and, and this is a Republican. Uh, in a conservative district, who who was able to have a, a, a good discussion about about drug policy and were able to yeah, he's, support. He's, he's not where he wanted to be, but that indicates he's not automatically locking away and throwing throw away heat. Yeah, I'd say most of the representatives are, are at least open to, to to discussing changes. Why do you think that is? Uh, I, I think part of it is um, most legislators ran for office because they wanted to see uh, problems in our state uh, changed. So if, if they, they see the problems that, that, that we see in, in our you know, criminal justice system where, where someone has a drug offense when they're a teenager and now they can't get a job and they're 50 years old, uh, they, they see that that, that that is a real problem in our system. and. Uh, and I'd, I'd say the overwhelming majority of, of legislators at least see that as a problem. Uh, the, the difficulty is trying to come to a solution that, that over half of the representatives can agree to. But uh, that, that's where we're working with. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so, Representative Davis, you uh, mentioned uh, that your bill is especially for people who are, I don't know, I forget what you said back in the day, like there's, there's some kind of extremity and like, uh, medical or you heard perhaps depressive cases or something like that. The, the right to try bill? Yeah, yeah, the right to try. Yeah, so it's uh, for people with, with debilitating uh, illnesses that have exhausted their other options in, in medicine where, uh, where where they've tried all of the, the prescription drugs and, and things aren't working for them. So that, this would open up the possibility of, of trying uh, psychedelics and, and other substances when, when the current medicine uh, has not worked for them. I'll expand on that a little bit. So the language talks about life-threatening and debilitating diseases. Um, originally, Missouri's right to try statute said terminal illnesses. We were one of the first states to go uh, the right to try route. And the reason, the rationale, you know, eight years ago was um, uh, you had people who were literally dying who, who there might be a uh, investigational drug out there in the clinical trial but they couldn't access that drug, even though they were dying, right? Because they couldn't qualify for the clinical trial, uh, because they couldn't get to the clinical trial site for whatever reason. So we passed Right to Try Missouri, I think, in 2014, uh, for uh, terminal illnesses. And uh, we've since changed the statute to debilitating and life threatening illnesses, right? So, which, is, which is quite broad, right? So, like, severe depression is life threatening. To kill yourself, right? Um, um, and the criteria is that you have to have considered all other options. That your doctor does say, okay, well, so do you think you, we think this will work, right? Let's look at the data, you know, um, you know. So, uh, you know, and so some conditions do not have uh, FDA approved medications, right? A lot of, you know, I think Dr. Thomas might talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, you know, the, the statute, you know, we, we really want you to, you know, go back, you know, I can, you know, we can be in touch with you after, afterwards and send you the actual text, but if there's any input on the text that we want that Representative Davis will refile, 
you know, we'll, we'll be happy to look at that and, and uh, you know, look for opportunity to make that change. Either if it's before the session begins, we just add it to the, to the bill. Or as the, as the uh, bill moves forward next year, or through the process, right, you'll have a committee here. And you might say, the best way to, for us to make this change that we propose is to find some of we'll offer an amendment in committee, right, have that debate in an open, deliberative process, right, with a consensus on it, and, and attach that, that language change that you're proposing. Uh, so, you know, and there, there might be some strategy to that, right? Um, because part of getting a bill passed, you know, is finding allies. Well, you know, this other lawmaker in my committee likes my bill, and I want him to make my, him, him a champion for it, right? So if I give him the opportunity to say, to take a little ownership of that, right? If I, if I give him a little opportunity to say, I made, I was able to help make this bill better by attaching an amendment that made it better, right? Then, he, then that lawmaker also has an investment in the success of this bill, right? Because every lawmaker at the end of the day is going to go back to their district and say, I helped pass this bill, right? And they'll want to take credit for that. They'll want to run on their record, right? So it's often a strategic pathway to say, okay, we're, we agree with you on, how, on what we want to change. We're going to work with this lawmaker and that lawmaker to achieve that change. And in, in so doing, create an ally to, that will help us advance down the road. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, Michael, thank you for making time for us today. Yeah, thanks for having me.